Let's continue our discussion on intermolecular forces. The last time we, in detail, talked about the London dispersion forces, which is the weakest of the three. Now we're moving on to dipole-dipole forces. Now we have a dipole. If, we, if there is a dipole in a molecule, there is a potential of the molecule being a dipole. <laughs> And uh, so what we do is we look at the difference in electronegativity between the atoms that form bonds. So we, we do know that carbon-carbon bonds have a, uh, ha are nonpolar. They have a difference in electronegativity that's zero. And carbon-hydrogen bonds have a difference of 0.4, which is uh, less than 0.5 and then considered nonpolar. It has to be at least 0.5 before it's polar. And uh, before we have a polar bond. And so here we have a carbon-oxygen bond. And so the difference there is 1.0. So this would be considered a dipole. And then the second question is, is it, is it symmetrical? Because sometimes these dipoles, if there's more than one, we don't have a dipole moment because uh, the symmetry, if it's highly symmetrical, it can cancel each other out. But in this case, if you draw the space filling model here on the right, you see the actual angles, right? This is not, these three carbon atoms are not arranged in a linear fashion. This is just so we can see the connectivity more clearly. And it's, it's uh, the angle here is 120 degrees of, of these carbons. So we get a clear polar bond here with a dipole moment. And so you can really see the regions of the negative and positive areas if you look at the electrostatic potential map, which is which is shown over here. So just as a review, it's the oxygen that is more electronegative. So the partial negative charge is here. And so the, re the more red a region of a, a molecule here in the electro poten electrostatic potential map, uh, the more negative and the green region is, is neutral and the blue region is positive. So we have a clear dipole moment that goes just from bottom up or from, from the carbon region to the nonpolar region here, which is the carbon, carbon and carbon hydrogen bonds towards this oxygen. So we have a clear dipole here and so it can interact with other uh, acetone molecules. So this is this is called acetone. It's the common name. You've probably heard of it. It's used in nail polish removers, and it's it's a liquid. It smells right, uh, but that has nothing to do with the dipole. But the fact that it is a liquid has everything to do with the dipole. Because if there wasn't a dipole, if it was nonpolar, it would probably be a gas because it has a very low molecular weight. And in order to have London dispersion forces, as a reminder, you have to have rather lots of electrons or a higher molecular weight. Okay, so here are two of these acetone molecules drawn side by side. And, and so the best one to look at is probably the two electrostatic potential maps, because you can really see how the interaction of these two molecules orient themselves from the negative to the positive end. And that, that's true for any kind of dipole-dipole interaction. So this one has a very nice symmetry and, and therefore uh, sticks to each other. And then obviously you have more than two, and so you get this network of molecules that are stuck to each other. OK, so here we are contrasting. These are two different molecules. Uh, form aldehyde, which is similar to acetone, except instead of having carbons attached to the central carbon where the polar bond is, it's just hydrogen. So it has a low molecular weight, just about 30 AMU or grams per mole, if you wish. This molecule is called form aldehyde, definitely has a dipole. And uh, in, in contrast, we have a completely nonpolar molecule here, ethane, which is just carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen. So these are nonpolar but it has almost the same exact same molar mass here, 30.07. And so, so for the London dispersion forces, molecular weight did matter. Uh, but when it comes to the stronger dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding, the molecular weight has very, very little, if nothing, to do with uh, the polarity of, of a molecule of a dipole moment, right? 
And uh, so they have drastically different boiling and melting points here, right? So, so there's a huge difference between, between the boiling point and, and the melting point. Uh, okay, so here we have a number of hydrocarbons that are that range in polarity starting out with the propane molecule which is completely nonpolar and and so you can nicely see it's completely green there is no difference in electronegativity anywhere it is uh, it is a gas at room temperature and so its boiling point is actually here this is in degrees K here so you got to remember that is about 240 degrees and and, and as you go and you add a dipole moment to it, or we, we're adding here, here we're adding an oxygen as well as here, and here we're adding a nitrogen, okay? So if we're just simply looking at the dipole between, and so this is a carbon to oxygen, carbon to oxygen, carbon to oxygen, it's just a single one of those dipoles. This is carbon to nitrogen, uh, by the way, the difference in electronegativity here is 0.5, and this is, as we said, 1.0. So here we are looking at adding a single, single polar bond, but we, we're not increasing the molecular weight by anything drastically. We're keeping it constant, but the boiling point goes up. So it's more than just looking at, oh, we have a polar bond here. In fact, you'd say that this is a weaker dipole. And it's almost nonpolar, so it, it should really fall below here. But it's also about the symmetry, right? So here we are adding dimethyl ether here. This looks like that has, uh, has of course, you've got two lone pairs on this oxygen. And I'm just going to abbreviate this as CH3 groups. And you have about 105 degree angle here, so you have the lack of symmetry. There's still symmetry here, but you, you do have a dipole moment going this way and this way, and so you get an overall dipole moment that is perhaps that way, but you have this larger region that's actually green here and, and nonpolar. So you, you do have a little bit of an, it's not shown because it's underneath it, it's inside of the board, it's where, that, where the blue region is. Uh, so, uh, I'm probably over explaining this, but the blue region here is, is not visible because it's behind of the board. But the fact of the matter is that, that symmetry also matters. And, and so in the case of the acetonitrile here, we have, uh, we, we, we have a very little that's obstructing or distributing the nonpolar part of the molecule. And, and therefore it is the strongest. So, so, so it's gonna become more clear on the next slide, I think. So it's important to have, first of all, to have a polar bond, carbon oxygen, we have a polar bond, but we also have to look at symmetry. And so this slide really explains it a little better. So here's a number of molecules, and uh, with the exception of the sulfur hydrogen bond here, we have mainly dipoles, except if you look at carbon dioxide, which has a strong dipole but it hasn't have doesn't have a dipole moment because this molecule is linear and so the forces cancel each other out so you've got a partial negative here and a partial positive here but the forces kind of cancel each other out so this is actually nonpolar nonpolar because it is symmetrical and, and does not have a dipole moment. It has a polar bond, but doesn't have a dipole moment. And whereas carbon monoxide only has, has the same dipole, and it has a dipole moment because the force only acts in one direction. So we have a partial negative and a partial positive. Uh, water, of course, has a dipole moment, but because, and I'm going to point this out already, this is not a dipole-dipole interaction because hydrogen is involved. We consider that a hydrogen bond, which is just an, a stronger dipole-dipole moment. And it, since it involves hydrogen, it is considered a hydrogen bond. That is the strongest intermolecular force. Uh, and uh, it, the last molecule here is also symmetrical, has a very strong dipole. It's pretty much 
borderline ionic, and, and uh, but because all these angles are 120 degrees here, these three dipoles cancel each other out. And so this is overall also nonpolar. Uh, this is nonpolar because it has a very low, it's, sim it's lex symmetry, but it has a very low difference in electron activity. So no polar bonds. This is symmetrical and this is symmetrical. But the other three are polar molecules. So you need to look at the difference in electron activity, which makes a polar bond, but you also need to look at symmetry. Here's another example of two molecules where one is polar, the other one is not. Uh, you don't even have to consider for this first one here that whether the bonds are polar or not, you can just argue that this is, this is symmetrical, this is flat, trigonal planar. And so if there is a dipole, and of course we know there is, but there wouldn't be a dipole moment, so this would be a nonpolar molecule that has symmetry. And uh, so the electronic shape of, of uh, both of these molecules is, is trigonal, so except here one of the regions is occupied by a lone pair, which uh, changes the symmetry. Uh, the overall symmetry is now bent, which makes it non-symmetrical and therefore potentially polar depending on the polarity of the bond. Uh, the final which the, and most strongest intramolecular force is the hydrogen bond and uh, we've already mentioned it more than once. You're probably all familiar with water and how it engages in hydrogen bonding and forms this extensive network. But if you're looking at the difference in electronegativity of several atoms here, boron, nitrogen, fluorine, carbon and oxygen, the boron hydrogen and carbon hydrogen bonds are less than 0.5, so they're nonpolar, but the the other three going from nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine, those of course increase in difference in electronegativity as you go through towards fluorine, the electro uh, in within the period, and so uh, NH, OH, and FH bonds are polar, so those are the ones that engage in hydrogen. And they do the exact same thing as dipole-dipole moments. Uh, so this is then, of, of course, what it does. We've seen this before. The negative and positive ends interact to form a weak intermolecular force. Here, a dashed line. The hydrogens have the positive regions, and the oxygen has the negative region. This is a better picture here. It shows the symmetry better, and it sort of makes an attempt at an electrostatic potential map here showing the interactions. Of course, that's why water is a liquid. And since this is such a strong intermolecular force, we can break it by sticking thermal energy into it. So if we increase the temperature of a glass of water at some point or a pot of water at some point, it will boil. And that means that the thermal energy is strong enough to break this force. And then these water molecules can go their separate ways in the form of steam. Now, hydrogen bonding does not have to occur between like molecules, right? So it doesn't have to be water and water. It can also be water and ethanol, right? As long as, like as is shown here, we have a water molecule that is polar and we have an ethanol molecule that's polar. And so they can interact also with their positive and negative ends. And so this will lead then to the next concept uh, in the next lecture about solubility, right? So polar molecules can mix with other polar molecules and, and so therefore are miscible or dissolve in each other. And, uh, uh, so, but, but here are just three examples of, of hydrogen bonding. And again, all you have to have is a dipole that involves hydrogen. And so then that's called hydrogen bonding. This is a nicer picture of what we just looked at here, ethanol, ethanol. This is just the line structure where I have used the dashed line to show the hydrogen bond. This one has a, a much nicer ethanol, ethanol uh, picture. And so the, again, the electrostatic potential map looks, looks pretty nice. It has that one region, the negative region towards the oxygen, of course, well, the bond, the polar, 
polar bond is between the carbon and the oxygen. And then you, you have these, these regions of, of neutral zones. And of course, these are calculations, right? So they're not, they're not uh, measured by any means. You can measure dipole moment, but, but these maps here are calculated and based on what we know from experiments. But it shows pretty nicely where, where the majority of the red and blue regions. So this is where the interaction would be shown right here. All right, so now beating this horse to death, but but uh, let's take a look at uh, what happens when we replace uh, the central atom here of, okay, so, so let's look at methane. Methane has a central atom, hydrogen, sorry, carbon, and it has four hydrogens attached. And so it's uh, tetrahedral. Uh, and so it's non-symmetrical, so it shouldn't really be, shouldn't really be, I mean, it is symmetrical. It's got 109.5 degree angles, so, so I take that back. It's symmetrical, of course, and so it shouldn't, shouldn't be pol polar, yet as you, this goes back to the London dispersion forces, right? So if you uh, replace the central atom with any of the group 14 elements, you go from carbon to silicon to germanium to tin, you are, uh, here's 10, you are increasing the molar mass, therefore you are increasing the potential of London dispersion forces. So just to be clear, this is not hydrogen bonding here, this is uh, London dispersion forces. Dispersion forces. Ah cut over here probably gonna put my face there later on anyway uh, uh, so just because there's hydrogen here yes we probably have a polar bond but uh, because of the symmetry these are nonpolar molecules and and so so here we have the lack of symmetry and yes we have hydrogen bonding here look at the drastic difference so you here you see the the uh, the, the, the the sulfur Hydrogen is a nonpolar bond, and and so you have to look at this separately, almost like uh, here we have an increase in London dispersion forces going from sulfur to selenium to lurium. So this is this group, and then this of course here has a dipole moment. It's non-symmetrical, so this is hydrogen bonding here, H bonding, and that's why the uh, the hydrogen bond is so strong. This is just contrasting those two. Here we just looked at uh, hydrogen disulfide versus water and the difference in uh, their physical properties. Water has a much larger boiling point and melting point, and of course it has a polar bond. It's, it's a big difference. It's nonpolar, or you know, it's really nonpolar, nonpolar, nonpolar. Okay. Uh, Final picture before I move on to the next to the next concept. Uh, it would make sense that a uh, dipole, a dipolar molecule like uh, water, would be able to dissolve ionic compounds, right? Of course, we do know from the solubility rules that there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it makes sense that uh, the positive ends of a dipolar molecule would be able to interact with an anion such as such as chloride here so and that we would be able to dissolve solid sodium chloride the water would then uh, dissolve or rip the chloride ions apart and then exposing the sodium ions and then the the red or 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 negative end of the water molecule would then dissolve and uh, the sodium ions okay so this is a Good transition point. Next, we'll look at how polarity deals with miscibility, and you know, mentioned it already. Okay, move on to the next lecture if you have any energy.